talk by Beatrox. I'm your host, Brandon. Today we have Tiffany here. Thank you very much for coming. I'm Tiffany and I'm currently a UX research and design lead at a company called Curap. And Curap is a digital health, um, digital therapeutics company, company based in Japan, but we're expanding our products to the United States. So I'm part of that project. Um, prior to being here, um, worked as a UX researcher mainly, but also worked at Beatrax. So happy to be invited to this interview and at this office again. It's wonderful to have you here. <laughs> uh, what is your educational background? Um, I understand that you went to the master's in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. What did you study there? Mm -hmm. That's a yeah. good question. So. I, yeah, my most recent education is in Masters of Human Computer Interaction and Design at UC Irvine. And prior to that, I did study human centered design in a Japanese college. So I did my undergrad in Japan. Okay, so are those related to your job now? Of mm -hmm. UX design, user research, um, design in general as a whole because a lot of people ask me what sort of things that they should study to become a UX designer or UX researcher. Mm -hmm. So how those um, make you uh, good designers um, in terms of like learning something at the college and yeah. applying those to the real world. Mm -hmm. um, how about yourself um, in your case? Yeah, that's yeah. definitely. Um, I think going to a master's program might be an overkill in terms of user experience and design, especially because your day-to-day -day, um, consists of working with real users, right? So they're usually not at schools. And then schools will give you like a fake project of, oh, go to a grocery store and like find a problem there and do something. But you know, that might not apply if you go work at an automobile company or you know, an AI company or something like that. So I think um, in a way you get like baseline knowledge of like what kind of methods, you know, how can you like showcase your designs better and like share that to your stakeholders might be really good practice in terms of you know academic pr purposes. But I think each project is really different. Each client that you work with, each industry is really different. So you don't really get to experience that in school. So I think I answered your question. Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's good. So uh, learn as you go. Yeah, uh, learn working. As, okay, yeah. cool, cool. And also, I understand that you worked for multiple different companies, mm -hmm. multiple different countries. Yeah. Um, in Japan, you worked for Big Tech. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, here in San Francisco, B Trucks is a design company, design agency. Yeah. Now you work for a startup. Mm -hmm. um, yes, startup. How are those experiences? Uh, are they any different in different different countries, or different uh, types of companies? Mm -hmm. The size and the roles, your roles. Um, how are those different? Mm -hmm. Working in Japan was uh, quite an interesting experience for me, since I was born and raised in the U.S. and I went to undergrad in Japan and started to work there. So a lot of things were new to me. Um, the first day I joined the Japanese company started with how to hand out business cards. And that was something I didn't know that I needed to know, but it did come in clutch because um, every time we do meet external partners or external vendors, we do business cards trading. And I think that was like the biggest like cultural differences that I experienced working in a Japanese company because that was my first and last that I would say because after I left that company I joined Btrax from the San Francisco office which does work with Japanese and American companies but I feel like the cultural here is more American and we don't really have that and the strictness of business rules that we follow in Japan and like we got to dress a little bit more casually in Japan. I was told to wear like high heels at, Seriously? The, at the Japanese company. Yes. I couldn't believe that. Yeah. With that company. Yeah, with that company. Oh my God. Exactly. <laughs> I, I consider that that company, that particular company is one of the most advanced tech, company. uh, tech companies mm -hmm. in Japan, but yeah. still. You would be wow. surprised, especially because the woman working in the product management side was very rare. So everyone was kind of confused of how, I guess, I don't know why they would be confused, but how they would be dressed 
is important as well, smiling all the time. So um, people who know me might, you know, understand that I might have issues with that. So yeah. But so those were like the cultural differences that I did experience in terms of business. Um, also working wise in Japan, I think HR or human resources really take part of your career growth. And they would mention like, oh, if you do want to become like a senior product manager, you have to experience like five other departments within the company to become a senior product manager. And for me, I think that was the biggest difference that I felt because I knew that I wanted to um, specialize in UX research and design. And it didn't make sense for me to experience product management and like growth team and like marketing team because I, I, all I wanted to do was be on the product side and work on UX research and design. So that is the reason why I went back to the US and got to experience being at the design company at Vtrax and expand my horizon as a UX researcher and design in the US. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. the, um, when it comes to um, going up the ladder, mm -hmm. um, do they typically, I'm talking about the companies in Japan, yeah. do they typically ask you to be a manager, man, uh, manager role mm -hmm. um, instead of a specialist? Is that typical? Mm -hmm. do, did, did you feel that you have to, you get a pressure to become a management person at a, um, eventually? Yes. Yeah. After you asked that, that just hit me right now, but they do ask you to be a manager rather than a specialist because mm -hmm. even when you become a second year, um, they will have their first you know, new grads coming into that company, they will be like, oh, you'll be their mentor. And like in a few years, you might be their manager. So mm -hmm. like start training that rather than like specializing in a skill. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah, speaking of that, I don't, yeah, this is tricky because when it comes to UX design as a role, mm -hmm. um, the question is how specialized, specialized mm -hmm. it is. Mm -hmm. Um, some people say that's really generic yeah. uh, role at this yeah. point. Um, so what would, what would be some of the advice you will give if somebody says she wants to become a UX designer? Mm -hmm. what, what sort of things that you recommend her to learn, study, or do mm -hmm. at the workplace? That's a good question. Yeah. I think for a UX designer, I would recommend when the passion to design okay. and the curiosity for your users or end users, you know, who you're designing for and what you want to design. Um, I think that's like the baseline to become a UX designer mm -hmm. because educational wise, I believe that UX design is very fluid. So, mm -hmm. you know, in the textbooks, they will tell you to like, you know, understand, I mean, understand the design process will be a really good place to learn how to start being a UX design, the product cycle of, you know, discovery work and then, you know, testing out the your thesis and designing and um and optimizing. So that process is really good to start, I guess, educationally, but it's also, you know, I love UX design because it's also very open to the public. It's free. You can just Google, you know, the Stanford's courses and like there's a lot of great resources and really great books by people. And so I think, you know, I would say, I would always tell my mentees that they don't need to go to a master's course or even like take a boot camp for and spend their money on UX design. And I would say, you know, what's the current problem that you want to, you know, resolve? And some of them might say like, oh, my mom is, you know, not feeling well and we want to track her health. And I'm like, okay, let's try designing an app for that for your mom, and that could be a start. And that, to me, that is UX design. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, and I understand that when you were with us, uh, mm -hmm. your interest, but still, I think your um, interest still is around design research, mm -hmm. yes. UX research, yes. design yes. research, mm -hmm. instead of uh, becoming a visual designer mm -hmm. or UI designer. Yeah. Uh, what made you um, passionate about research side instead of uh, actual design side, mm -hmm. I would say, yeah, visual yeah. design side, yeah. Um, 
I don't have any artistic skills. It doesn't matter. You know, I think working with Jonathan, who is the UX designer or designer at Vtrax, um, he made me realize how design is amazing and intricate. But I think for me, I don't have the passion to show that, you know, artistic side through, you know, research or design is more, I, I am very, uh, I am better at talking to users and mm. like pulling out, you know, what their pain points are, what their needs are, you know, what their values are and putting that into words and handing it off to a designer because I think I'm good at grasping it, but I'm not good at like outputting it okay. Yeah, okay. as a designer. Is design research a big thing in Japan? Mm, I would say it's growing. It's okay, definitely okay. growing. Um, when I was in Japan back in 2018, there was no you know, job position called researcher. Um, I think a lot of times the product managers did their research or the designers did their research. But I see now um, little by little in like, you know, more advanced, not advanced, like trending companies, mm. they are hiring like design researchers. Okay. Okay. But I don't think it's there yet. <laughs> I, I feel like design research itself is such a new thing, the last okay. 10 years maybe, Yeah. Max. Uh, and in Japan, <laughs> when I talk to our clients in Japan, they say like, if I ask them, like, who is your target user, yeah. so they say, like, oh, maybe 25 female <laughs> single. Yeah. And, what? Simple. That's all? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and usually, like, in Japan, like, if you say, like, 30-year-old housewife, mm -hmm. uh, female, then you can imagine how they react, how they behave. Yeah. But it's so different by different cultures yeah. and different people in different countries. Mm -hmm. So um, I think um, design research became so crucial in the process of design now, yeah. um, and that's exactly what you do. Mm -hmm. um, yes. So when you work with, say, UI designer or product designer, yeah. um, how, how, how does the process work? Mm -hmm. uh, just in case people do not know how the design researchers mm -hmm. and designers work together. Yeah. yeah. Um, we follow the same design process, so sometimes when you're creating a new product, you need to do discovery research. Mm. So a lot of times the design researchers will conduct the discovery research that might include like, you know, interviews or observations of, you know, the general idea of who you want to know more about. Mm. So let's say if you're creating a new app for you know, hypertension, that's what I'm doing right now. Mm. Patients with hypertension, you know, we don't know anything about patients with hypertension. So we would first go talk to them, observe them, to see what a life as a hypertension patient looks like. And I would put that into maybe a persona or maybe like an empathy map that kind of shows, you know, who is, a, you know, what they think about, what they do on their daily basis and kind of contextualize mm. a patient with hypertension for our designers to help them think about, okay, what kind of features, what kind of product are they looking for? And that could look like an ideation workshop, you know, you can even join like a product manager or even a business developer because they have all different perspectives of what an app or a you know, website should be. So it's a lot of cross-functional um, collaboration, I would like to say but a lot of times the baseline of where their discussion comes mm. from would be the design researchers providing discussion points. Okay. Mm. Um, are there any particular techniques that you use to interview users? Mm. Uh, because depending on how you ask questions or how you do the follow-up questions, mm -hmm. uh, answers will be very different, mm -hmm. uh, could be translated in different ways. Yeah. So what would some of the basic uh, ways or techniques that you do when you when it comes to mm -hmm. uh, interviewing people. Definitely. Yeah. Um, I think one of the techniques is, well, one simple technique is always make sure to have like an icebreaker session oh. before you go into the interview. Okay. Okay. So a lot of times these interviews are recorded, but mm -hmm. before recording, I usually have a casual conversation for like 10 minutes to mm -hmm. warm it up and see what their comfort, um, you know, level of comfort is 
sometimes they're a little shy, so they might be hesitant to ask personal questions in the beginning. But if they open up, you know, they might be more comfortable in the beginning. So, or in the later in the interview. So, um, opening up another simple rule would be. Uh, making sure in the beginning that they are compensated for this interview and then you know so that they have like all these like other worries that they might have in their own um, mind like away so like making sure they have no worries coming into the interview okay okay um how much interview or researches do you think is enough to design <laughs> product in appropriate ways my answer would be it's always not enough. Okay. <laughs> I think it's hard to um, put a limit on, or it, say like this is the amount that we have to fill. I think that's very difficult to um, set because when you're, especially when you're in the startup phase or when you're creating a product from you know zero, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. think that's the answer, right? Yeah. So as you, you know, do more research, there's going to be a lot more questions mm -hmm. and like things that you just didn't know about that you have to figure out. And I feel like that is just never ending. So I think in the real world, research is cut off when the budget is there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think that's it, right? <laughs> Are there any cases that you had uh, some, or your team had an um, mm -hmm. assumption but mm -hmm. the the outcome after talking to people are very different mm -hmm. and well what would you do if that happens mm -hmm. yeah yeah i think one memorable research that i've done was um that had a different outcome was actually with an american ed tech company mm -hmm. who wanted to expand their products in japan and the assumption that we had or what we didn't even think about is Japanese college students you know are tech savvy and can do anything with their mobile phones and computer mm -hmm. devices so you know the product that we want to test like we don't even have to like train them or educate them with it you know they will be able to use it as is was our assumption we went in and I started conducting the interview getting to know the college students and I realized that these college students haven't, you know, even wrote a digital essay oh, on the computer. On the, yeah, they all yeah, write a paper. Yeah. So they have a really difficult time, like, you know, spelling out English words in their mobile phones because they actually usually write everything out. Mm. And we were just like, I was very shocked by that because I didn't know um, that was, a, you know, a culture in Japan so that was like okay we have to stop the interview and figure out you know what we can change the app and I think that outcome itself was already enough to understand like this product isn't going to work yeah, in Japan yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. so if that I had a very similar experience uh, working with a client uh, we had a, a really positive assumption of, mm -hmm. about the um, feedback yeah. on the product. Mm -hmm. And the potential users say that they're not very happy with it. Mm -hmm. uh, they may not use it. Yeah. And the client's reaction is, well, they're not the right people to yeah. interview with. Uh -huh. Find somebody else who could be better target yeah. of this product. Um, does that kind of thing happen to your case? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> it did happen because yeah. I think, you know, a lot of times companies don't want to hear that it doesn't yeah. work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think when I was a little bit younger, that was a really hard thing for me to tell mm. to the other person, like, oh, I think this app isn't going to work in the market that you're, you know, you're targeting. Yeah. And you might have to like pivot your business or pivot your product. And but now I feel confident because that's what they need to hear because mm. we all wish the other company's success. Yeah. Okay, okay, cool. Um, give me top three things that you should not do when you do user research. Top three things that you shouldn't do. Um, the uh, <laughs> type of questions that you should not ask or phrases you should not use or, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, what would be, if it's a 
it's an interview, um, qualitative interview interviews, you shouldn't ask biased questions. Okay. Um, okay. You shouldn't lead them to answer that you want to hear, like, oh, you like bicycle riding, right? <laughs> you know? Yeah, so along with that, um, don't ask yes or no questions okay. because it is a qualitative interview. You want to take the quote that how exactly they mentioned it. And if they, if their answer is vague in a way where you didn't understand if it was a yes or a no, mm -hmm. you can always clarify, but, you know, don't force them if it's like, do you like this or not? Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, last question, I think. Um, how, what would be your advice to potential designers? Mm -hmm. um, how they should decide whether they should be uh, more like a research side or mm -hmm. uh, visual design, UI design side or product design? Mm -hmm. um, what would be the um, key factors that they should um, take into consideration when they decide on the career? It's a tough question. It I is. do get asked a lot yeah. as a mentor, and because in many cases, yeah. like younger people say that they're not hundred percent sure <clears throat> which directions that they want to go. Yeah, yeah. And I think that question also differs if you work in Japan or if you work in the United States, mm. because in the United States, you know, job functions are separated pretty mm. clearly. Yeah. Clearly, so. Yeah. In American companies, you'll see you know researcher roles and or designer roles. So you don't have to have that mixed feelings of oh I want to do this or that. Like you have to choose. But in Japan, I feel like they don't really separate it just yet, just because the Japanese market is not there. Um, so a lot of times designers might have to do the research role. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's different. But all that aside. Um, a lot of times I think it's personality and curiosity, <laughs> I don't know. I really don't know the answer to that. I think I haven't found like the great way to um, like tell that to my mentees as well, but mm, what's a good answer? If somebody is very yeah. shy mm -hmm. about talking to people, then mm -hmm. they might be a, mm -hmm. uh, for good for UI design or visual design, I don't know, like maybe mm -hmm. possibly. Um, oh, one more. Um, does um, the AI technologies impact your job, or uh, if so, how when it comes to design or design research? Because, um, mm -hmm. you know, visual design, UI design, illustration, mm -hmm. absolutely. Gener uh, generative AI yeah. is impacting the whole industry mm -hmm. now. Yeah. Um, how about towards the design research field? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's impacting positively, you okay, can okay. say. Um, there's a lot of design research tools, softwares out there where mm -hmm. you can record your interview and the AI will do like a quick like analysis for you mm -hmm. and like mm -hmm. whatever mm -hmm. phrases that the users mentioned, they will like mark it as positive or negative. So mm -hmm. a lot of like research findings analysis are, you know, being simplified with the automations, um, besides that, you know, you can use like ChatGPT or yeah, ChatGPT to like write your script and kind of like talk through with ChatGPT what type of questions I should ask mm -hmm. and um, kind of help you with like competitive research, competitive analysis. So I do talk to my ChatGPT often <laughs> day to day. <laughs> but the technology doesn't replace real human mm. to talk to when it comes to doing the research. Because you could ask the same questions to ChatGPT yeah. or any AI uh, LLM yeah. to uh, like see if they give us um, positive feedback or negative. But you don't think that it will replace the actual... Mm. I don't think yeah. it will replace um, just because you know, I don't know like the gender or like the diversity oh, of the true. chat GPT is. Yeah. You know, sometimes yeah. you want to talk with patient or not patients like users with disability mm. you know and I don't think chat GPT can exemplify themselves as you know I you know they have a disability or something like that so I think you will always have to talk with a real user at the end of the day but chat GPT will help you guide like you know mm. what better questions or how can you better now analyze 
Okay. Okay. Um, any last uh, messages to people who are interested in becoming a design researcher? What I would tell my mentees if they're always contemplating between being a designer or a researcher is one, do you enjoy using Figma? Oh, that's <laughs> good. As a researcher, I'm used to taking notes like on paper, maybe like post-it notes on Miro, but if you tell me to put like an output of a quick screens mm -hmm. of using Figma and showcase to your stakeholders as a prototype, even just like a very low-fi prototype, mm -hmm. It would take me half a day, you know, and half a day is a good day. <laughs> yeah. It might take me a few days, but, you know, if you're really quick with it, you know, remembering shortcuts on Figma and just enjoying creating mock-ups. Um, I can say that I don't enjoy creating mock-ups, so I think, you know, that's the difference. If you do enjoy, you should become a designer because that skill will, you know, go through, like, a lot of different things because you will always need to show a prototype. I still remember that when I was uh, when I was working with you, yeah. uh, you I think you designed uh, presentation uh -huh. slides. Yeah. And my my reaction was, how come it looks so plain? A <laughs> uh, designer should design something that looks more sexy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think as a researcher, I do want to just cut to the chase and showcase, you know, the key highlights, the findings, and I don't need any designs to showcase that. <laughs> but I am learning now, and I think a lot of my presentations now come with actual, like, I take time to make highlight reels now. So I would cut, okay. like, you That's know, good. 10 That's seconds, good. 15 yeah. second clips yeah. from my interviews and showcase a quote with that because I realized how powerful a quote can be attached to the presentation and the stakeholders are very inspired and it's easier for them to understand than just key highlights and summaries. That's, that's <laughs> absolutely true. This particular interview um, also becomes a highlighted um, mm -hmm. Instagram reel mm -hmm. with okay. the captions and yeah. it, looks, it looks really good. Yeah, yeah. it's really effective. Yeah. So. Yeah. I think that's what I would tell them. Very good. Yeah. Tiffany, thank you for coming today. Thank I really enjoyed you. talking to you. Yeah. And if you like this video, please make sure to hit the like button and leave comments. And make sure to subscribe to the channel. And see you in the next episode. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.